Hello, everyone. I didn't do my hair today. That's fine. Hey, guys, welcome to Books and Brew. Oh, my God. Uh, things are still on a chaotic mess around here, as you can quite tell. We are uh, on a precipice. The edge. Not sure whether or not we'll be leaving today, tomorrow, or next week. Uh, so <laughs> it's been kind of... Annoying. Yeah, that's a good word for it. <laughs> uh, we apologize if you can hear our AC and fan going on right now because it is steamy. It is 100 degrees and it is still yeah. 9 o'clock. It's a hot day. And uh, for a hot day, you need some AC going on right now as well as some fans to get all that boosted. So uh, if you hear a nice, subtle, white sound hum, that's, that's us. Don't worry. That's not your headphones. You know, your headphones are fine. Maybe you need to upgrade them. I don't know. I can't tell you. Uh, you could tell that we haven't done this in a while. Uh, well, last time I we went off on a mutant tangent. We went on an X-Men tangent. Same, same. We really, yeah, we really went off on the X-Men, didn't we? That was crazy. Uh, well, uh, I guess enough beating around the bush in terms of what we mean from that opening dialogue. Uh, we're still waiting for our level zero fighter human. Who said he was gonna be a fighter? It's the easiest class to start with. I feel like it's the easiest class to start with. Right. What do you think? What do you think? I don't it have one. I just don't think you should be picking for him. Okay. All right. We said that we were gonna roll hit hit uh, uh, yeah, uh, ability we, score when he's born, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to do that. Depends on how tiny he is. Exactly. Maybe he's a rogue. We'll know. We'll know. After a while. By the size of my belly, I don't think he's a tiny barbarian. <laughs> I hope not. Yikes. That's scary. First one out of the gate of our a barb. Poof. Uh, but you know what class is interesting? Hmm. This is the greatest segue I could have ever given myself. Uh what class is both interesting and something we actually haven't talked a lot about uh it's a custom class something that uh one of the villains in our main campaign is that uh who knows when it'll show back up uh blood hunters they're in the main campaign now in our main campaign main ca yeah. campaign yeah have you forgotten I remember like Vargo back in like what you call it. Yeah, Vargo was. I guess he's not really a main villain, was he? He was more like a side villain. Yeah, but not in Mostad and um, Nomad. I'm talking about our, the 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 campaign that is streamed on this channel. Oh, I don't remember the Blood Hunter. Vargo was a was a uh, a Blood Hunter. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying Mostad. I don't remember who the Blood Hunter is. Vargo. Vargo is a different campaign. Vargo is in Magic at Mostad. Uh uh. The yellow tiefling, or the gold, the black tiefling with the yellow, uh, the gold, uh, decorations. The one that lost his horns. Yeah, that's freaking Nomad. Who is looking for Vargo? I don't know, but it's in my notes. I could literally look it up. It's not Mosted. It is Mosted. No, it's not. The leader of the Scorpions is looking for Vargo. Oh, Where's yeah. the Scorpions? Yeah. Forgot about that. But um, like, he's not like a main thing. He's like, not. No, he us. definitely. He was. He's more of an annoyance. Yeah, but I mean, like, I don't think we've ever seen him. Like Vera and Broly and Savannah. You guys fought him once. No, you guys fought him twice. I feel like you're mixing. What are you talking about? I know my campaign. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? I don't feel like I thought that was. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. That was so long ago. Yeah, uh, that's all. I'm like, I'm pulling way back. That was when we were with uh, what's his face, Tom's character. Yeah, you were with um, what was his character's name? I forget right now. I know he was like a bard, and he was red. I think. I think he was. Yeah, a red. he had a he was a red tiefling bard, um, and he was a lore. Either he was, he was a lore or he was a swordsman. I forgot which was which. I forget. No, Od... Uh, 
Odolin is is uh is Aaron's character. Olivin. Olivin, yeah, Olivin. <laughs> so Olivin was a guest character. We had uh, the two satyr, uh, no satyrs, uh, the two uh, scimitars, scimitars, centaurs. Cim centaurs, yes, two weapons. Two cent, two centaurs. Tired, apparently, we're brain dead. Uh, and then we had uh, Masato. How could you forget about Masato? You're gonna look him up. I forgot his name. Maybe I can look it up. Oh, Duma. Duma! Oh, Duma. My brain. That's right. Hey, you know what? We both had a moment right now. But yes, I want to talk about Blood Hunters because I'm going to be very honest. I reread a little bit of, about their stats. Kind of want to play a Blood Hunter one day. I feel like they're not OP until they level. Uh, well, we're going to find out. Uh,. I mean, we never really got to see a full-on Blood Hunter in, in in action. Obviously, the first Blood Hunter we've ever got, you know, introduced to was uh, Molly Mock from Critical Role, and now we're getting introduced to a new Blood Hunter, uh, Chutney, uh, in Campaign Three. Chutney. Chutney. Yeah, it's right, Chutney. Uh, so it, it's interesting take. One of them was, I believe, uh, let me see. One of them was a Ghost Slayer that was. Um, Molly, and of course, uh, the Order of the Lycan is Chitney. Chitney. So we're gonna go through a few of these. First of all, I, I don't think we're gonna have time to go through all of the subclasses for Bloodhunter, but we could basically go through all of the main class features that you get while you're playing this. Once again, I need to remind everyone, this was created by Matt Mercer and Talison Jaffe. This is a full Critical Role homebrew, technically. It is uh I thought spawn. it came out in some source books, though, like certain... Not official wizards. Hmm. It's still considered homebrew. Uh, so, yes. The first thing you get... Uh, well, I should mention this when it comes to creating your... Uh, your... Uh, sure. Blood Hunter. Is that, first of all, one of the prerequisites is that you uh, have to have an intel... Like, essentially, it asks that your intelligence score is high... Uh, and it also asks that either your strength or dexterity has to be high as well. So almost like a paladin where your charisma and your strength has to be up. Uh, this is sort of like your intelligence plus strength or dexterity. Huh. You can play it in different ways. We have saw Chutney being sort of the buffy, the buffy version of uh, Bloodhunters while we saw Molly being more in the dexterous type of finesse weapons. No reason Chet is dexterous is because like he has like the rogue stuff. Yeah, I mean he's not lacking in, in dexterity, obviously, but he, I think he's more strong than he is dexterous. I believe so. Uh, first of all, when it comes to their hit die, uh, they're rocking a D10. They're rocking a fighter's D, uh, D10. Huh. Um, that's necessary, especially as you start to get into the actual uh, class itself, because you sacrifice a lot of HP four abilities so it kind of makes sense that you have a little bit of buffer room when it comes to getting your full hp it really sucks that like that was really molly's downfall like his own fucking ability was his downfall yeah it was just done at the wrong time i'm like dude you should not be uh hindering yourself right now made a bad choice made a really bad choice uh, so yeah, your your hit die is a d10. So whenever you level up and you take the average, that's a d that's a six plus your Constitution modifier. Uh, considering the fact that your biggest stats are going to be Intelligence, Dexterity, or Strength, I can imagine that Constitution shouldn't be on the lowest end. You should have some HP pool to pull from. Uh, saving throws. First of all, you get. Proficiency in dexterity and intelligence saving throws. Uh, you are proficient with medium, light uh, armor, as well as shields. And you have proficiency in simple or martial weapons. Huh. So you have, you're have you pretty much a fighter at that point. Except for the heavy weapons proficiency. Uh, and right off the bat, you get proficiency in alchemist tools. So you get some benefits right away. Uh, at first level... You gain Hunter's Bane. 
You survive the Hunter's Bane, a dangerous, long-guarded ritual that alters your life's blood, forever binding you to the darkness and honing your senses against it. You have advantage on wisdom slash survival checks uh, to track phase fiends, undead, as well as intelligence checks to recall information about such creatures. So it's kind of why uh, Chutney's always like, what do I smell, Fay? Well, I think he had a pick, right? Well, it says here you can choose. You have you have advantage in all these checks on yeah. people. Oh, I thought his like thing was specifically Faye. Uh, no, no. Oh. I think the only reason we're seeing a lot of Faye is because Campaign Three is very Faye oriented. We're starting to notice. Hunter's Bane also imp uh, empowers your body to control and shape uh, Hemiocraft, using your own blood and life essence to fuel your abilities. Some of the feature features require you to make a saving throw to resist the feature's effects. Uh, so, basically keep that in mind. You okay? I yawned once and that's it. We'll see. <laughs> uh, no, I mean like that's it. I just keep yawning once I yawn. Oh, once. good point. Yeah, yeah. At first level, you get uh, your blood maldix. Uh, you gain the ability to control and sometimes sacrifice a part of your vital essence to curse and manipulate creatures through hemiocraft magic. You know one blood curse of your choice, and you may learn an additional blood curse at 6th, 10th, 14th, and 18th level. Each time you learn a new blood curse, you can always choose from another one and replace it. Uh, each time you use your blood maledic feature, uh, you choose which curse to invoke. Uh, while invoking the curse, uh, but before it affects the creature, you may, you may choose to amplify the curse by taking a chronic damage equal to one Hemiocraft die. Uh, and if you're curious, the Hemiocraft die is a D4, upgrades to a D6 at 5th level, upgrades to a D8 at 11th, and upgrades to a D10 at 17. So how many curses do you get to choose if you have to switch them out? Good point. Uh, good question. Between first and fifth level, you only know one blood curse. Oh. At sixth to ninth level, you know two. At tenth to thirteenth, you know three. At fourteenth to seventeen, you know four. And at eighteenth to twenty, you know five. Oh. So it, goes, it upgrades every time you, you know, every time you go up. Now, there is a few curses here that uh, are kind of locked away between subclasses. So I don't think I'm going to go through the blood curses, even though they are the really cool part of this class at all. We'll see. We'll see if we have time. Uh, at second level, now that was all in first level, by the way. You get a blood curse. You uh, have advantage on things. Uh, and you have proficiencies in a bunch of things. You're basically a fighter with blood magic. Uh, yo, Shady. And uh, at second level, you get a fighting style. Huh. You can choose archery, meaning you have a plus two bonus to attacks on uh, range weapons. Uh, dueling. This, is, I think, is what Molly had, which is you gain a plus two to damage rolls when you're, you know. Oh, no, no. He was, I think he had a two-handed, two-weapon fighting. Yeah, because he had the scimitar and the... the fancy blade. Yeah. Dueling is when you only have one sword and shield. And great weapon fighting, which means you have two hands on one, uh, a great axe, a great sword, a long sword, things like that. So you get some options. Fighter, you get a lot more. This is like a reduced fighter. Which is fine. It's not meant to be the same, though. True. 100% true. Uh, at second level, you get Crimson Rite. Just keep in mind, Crimson Rite is different than your Blood Curse. Your Blood Maledic and your Blood Curse are totally something different. But your Crimson Rite is something different. That is, uh, you get to infuse your weapon strikes with elemental magic. As a bonus action, you can activate your right, uh, you, uh, activate the right that you know while holding the weapon, your, while holding the weapon, your weapon. Uh, the effect of the right lasts until you take a short or long rest, so you can just activate it in the morning, you have it all day. Uh, 
When you activate your right, you take necrotic damage equal to one Hemiocraft die. This is what Chutney and Molly did a lot, is that they would cut themselves, they would take that damage, and then they would have elemental magic into their weapon. Uh, so while your effect, well, your, your uh, Crimson Right is affected, all your attacks on that weapon is considered magical to go past resistances. Hmm. So at second level, you're already going past that. I know some, like, monks don't get magical fists until sixth level. You know? And at, by second level, more than likely, you're not having a magical item, like a magic weapon. Unless you're lucky. Unless you're lucky. <laughs> So think about that you know, right away. With you. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. You choose one right from below, and you choose another right at seventh, seventh, and fourteenth level. Uh, you can get flame, frozen, storm. So I'll just list out the damage types. Fire, cold, lightning, and when you get to fourteenth level, you can choose necrotic, psychic, or thunder. Not bad. If you just need the element right away, right there. Uh, let's see what else. Extra attack at fifth level, you get two attacks in one turn. That's pretty good. Never, yeah, never bad to sneeze at that. Honestly. Uh, at sixth level, you get brand of cast uh, castigration. It's not castration. I know that for sure. There's a G in there. I uh, just see the word. Yeah. When you damage a creature with a weapon for which you have a crimson, uh, an active crimson right on, uh, you can channel Hemiocraft magic to sear a arcane brand in that creature. No action required, just happens. Mm. Uh, you know the direction of that branded creature as long as it's in the same plane as you. Further, each time the branded creature deals damage to you or a creature that you could see within five feet, the branded creature takes psychic damage equal to your Hemiocraft modifier. I think that's what Chet was trying to do this time around, but then they were like, oh, you don't have it yet. Yes. Yeah, because he was level 5. This doesn't activate to level 6. Inter that's a good point. I forgot about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, he didn't say Bram, but he said he was just trying to mark them so they couldn't. Yeah. They couldn't By the way, away. your Hemiocraft modifier is your intelligence modifier. Well, you said that you wanted them to be smart. Uh, your brand lasts until it's dismissed or until you use this feature again to brand another creature. Hold on. Oh, it's like Hex. But it lasts forever. The brand can be dispelled with a dispel magic and is treated as a spell with an equal level to half your blood hunter uh, level. That's incredible. Well, what if you die then does it move? Oh, yeah, yeah, when you die. It's like a spell. Yeah. Because it says that you can track someone. Can you brand someone without them knowing? No, you have to do damage to them. So I I guess technically if you were playing around and you're like, let's do a let's do a sparring match. I'm gonna hit you. <laughs> That's a good sparring match. Alright, buddy, I'll see you later. You already know where they are. Always. You branded them. I guess you could be kind of hard. You're damaging them, you know? I'm sure there's a broken way you can do it. Just throw a rock at someone and hide. See, my DM brain is going off now. The reason why I'm thinking this is that at second level, you get a fighting style. Mm -hmm. You could choose archery, which is range weapons, and... Throwing a stone, like with a sling, is considered a ranged weapon attack. So could you activate your Crimson Right on a stone? Or on a sling? I mean, if you can activate it on a thing, you could probably just set a trap for them and then they'd be branded. Well, it has to be done on a weapon. Hmm. Or blow darts. I think you can do that. Because it's giving you the range op option. So you can pretty much play a Blood Hunter that cuts a little bit of themselves puts it in the blow dart <laughs> goes off <laughs> hit someone like pull it out and, like someone just try to tag me one point of damage uh -huh. they walk away you mark them 
You know where they're going. That's not, pretty good. Not creepy at all. At ninth level, you get grim uh, psychometry. I think I actually did say that right. Uh, you gain supernatural talent for discerning secrets surrounding mysterious relics or past places touched by evil. Whenever you make an intelligence check, uh, sorry, history check, uh, to recall uh, information about sinister or tragic history of an object that you are touching or the current location, uh, you have advantage. Uh, at the DM's discretion, a, set of, uh, a suitably high roll may cause your character to experience brief visions uh, of past connections to the object or location. It's a little weird. At ninth level, you get advantage on history checks. That's what all that meant. It was a fluffed up way to say it. It was a long way to saying it, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, one level extra, tenth level, you get... Uh, Dark uh, Augmentation. The magic of Hemiocraft uh, uh, goes through your body to permanently reinforce your resilience. Your speed is increased by 5, and you have a bonus to Dexterity, uh, Strength, and Constitution saving throws equal to your Hemiocraft modifier. That's pretty good. That's really good. You have a modifier of 5? That means your saves... Really a uh, plus 9. Oh, it's a good question. Yeah, because I mean, it's plus the, what you already had and then plus... So we're at level 10, yeah? Yeah. So... At level 10, your proficiency bonus is a plus 4. Uh-huh. And let's say your modifier, intelligence, is a 5. That's a plus 9. And now we're going to go further on. Let's say that you have to make a constitution saving throw and you have a plus 2 modifier to that con mod. So that's an, a, a plus 11 to your constitution saving throws at level 10. I'm like, what level was Molly? <laughs> he was five. Yeah. yeah, he didn't, if he was up to there, he, he would've- He got whacked away before his time. For reals. Now I'm thinking he must've been really scary in the- Oh yeah, well like when they had to fight him, but I'm pretty sure that, like Matt beefed him up. I was gonna say in the Vox Machina versus Mighty Nine mm. one shot, you know? Asking him to make a con save would have been like a plus... How Because they were level 15. I thought they didn't use him. They did use Molly. Oh. That's what Talison was the wild card. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, moving on from that. Level 13, Brand of Tethering. Starting at 13th level, the psychic damage from your Brand of... Uh, of Castration? Gration? It's not. It can't be castration. Hope not. Uh, increases uh, to twice your Hemiocraft modifier. So now, twice would it have? Uh, in addition, a brandy creature can't take the dash ac dash action, and if it attempts to teleport or leave its current plane by any means, it takes 4d6 damage and must make a Wisdom saving throw. On a failure, the attempt to teleport. Uh, or leave the plane fails. I don't think he used that. He did oh. on on uh, Scanlan. Oh. Scanlan tried to teleport doing a dimension door, and uh, he was like, I think uh, Talson was like, "Hey, wait, 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 wait! Is he trying to teleport?" And so I think even I think even Sam Regal was like, "Well, yeah, I'm teleporting, but that doesn't do a a reaction." It's like, yes, it does for me. So that's pretty cool. Uh, at 14th level, you get Hardened Soul. You have advantage on saving throws of, uh, against being charmed and frightened. That's just nice to have. Permanently? Yeah, it's nice to have. Uh, and last but not least, level 20. Uh... Sanguin? Sanguin. Sanguin. Sanguin? I need to read these S -A -N -G -U -I -N -E. words. S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. That sounds like sanguine or something. Sanguin. <laughs> Hold on. Don't worry. Uh, 
Google will tell us. S A N G U I N E? Yeah. That's what it is. San Blood red. Gwyn? Sanguine. That sounds made up. That sounds like a thing I can say. Sanguine? Sanguine? What the fuck is that? What is a sanguine? It means a uh, adjective optimistic optimistic or positive but then it says literary blood red or blood red color so it kind of makes sense okay still weird all right sanguine mastery uh, upon re reaching level 20 the mastery of blood magic uh reaches its height mitigating your sacrifices and empowering your expertise once per turn whenever a blood hunter feature requires you to roll a hemiocraft die you can re-roll that die and use either roll. Additionally, whenever you score a critical hit with a weapon, which you have an active crimson right on, you regain one expended use of your blood maledic features. That's okay. That's pretty good. Getting some, getting a lot of things going on. You know, it's fine. Let's uh, talk about the blood curses. I want to talk about the blood curses. Your blood maledix. Uh, let's go through the ones that everyone can pick. Blood curse of the anxious. As a blood, as a bonus action, you can harry the body or mind of a creature within 30 feet of you, making them susceptible to forceful influence until the end of your next turn. Charisma, uh, or sorry, int uh, intimidation checks made against that cursed creature have advantage. You may amplify, uh, and the cursed creature must make a wisdom saving throw. Uh, wait, the next, sorry, the next wisdom saving throw the cursed creature makes has to be done with disadvantage. This kind of sounds like Charm Person. Like a what? Like a version of Charm Person. Uh, in a way, yeah. There is a spell, I think, that allows you to, it's like Friends. I think the spell is called Friends. Oh, Fast Friends. No, no, no. It's a cantrip oh. that's called Friends. And I don't like it because it only lasts like a minute. And after it's done, they know you charm them. There is no saving throw. It just means you have advantage in all checks with them. But after a minute, they're going to turn around and be like, hey, the fuck? Well, I mean, if you're in combat and you have time to get away. I guess so. Blood Curse of the Binding. As a bonus action, you may attempt to bind a large or smaller creature that you can see within 30 feet of you. Uh, they must make a strength saving throw. On a failure, the cursed creature's speed is reduced to zero and they can't use reactions until the start of your next turn. It's like planar, bl planar binding, where like you bound them to the plane. It's more like whole person. Uh, but it requires a strength saving throw, which is, it, I mean, against like a spellcaster, that's pretty good. You may amplify this, and the curse lasts for one minute and still, unless, uh, you know, as opposed to one turn. Yeah. Uh, and any uh, affected creatures, regardless of size. Oh, it can affect any creature, like a dragon. All right. The cursed creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the curse on itself if it succeeds. It succeeds. That is like a whole person at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Blood curse of the bloated agony. That just sounds gross. <laughs> As a bonus action, you curse a creature that you can see within 30 feet of you, causing its body to swell until the end of its next turn. For the duration, the creature has disadvantage on all strength checks, dexterity checks, and takes 1d8 necrotic damage if it makes more than one uh, attacks during its turn. It can, but a dragon will resist it. Yes, and more than likely, a dragon will succeed that saving throw, too. You may amplify the bloated agony curse uh, for one minute. It lasts for one minute instead of one turn. Uh, and the creature must make a constitution saving throw at the end of each of his turn. Uh, if it succeeds, it ends the curse. I'm going to go through a few of these that are a little cooler. Huh? Blood Curse of the Eyeless. This is what Molly did a lot of times. 
Right. When a creature you can see within 30 feet of you makes an attack, you can use your reaction to roll one Hemiocraft die and subtract that number from the creature's attack roll. That's pretty good. Uh, Vargo's done to this to you guys plenty of times. You can choose a creature, uh, choose to use this feature after the creature's roll, but before the DM determines whether or not it hits or misses. You may amplify this curse uh, to all of the creature's attack rolls until the end of its turn. So essentially, you could roll that one Hemiocraft die to all the attacks. Well, if they hit you. If they don't hit you, then you're good. Yeah. Uh, let's go through two more, and then we'll be done for today. Let's do... Uh, let's do Blood Curse of the Muddled Mind. As a bonus action, you can curse a creature that you can see within 30 feet of you that is concentrating on a spell or using a feature that requires concentration. The creature then has disadvantage on its next constitution saving throw. If it makes... Uh, uh, sorry, concentration saving throw it makes to maintain concentration on it. So you can be like, you're concentrating. But first of all, bonus action, fuck you. And I'm going to hit you to break that concentration. Disadvantage. Hey, well, if you have a lore caster, it's just an even roll. Oh, that's a straight roll. Yeah, straight roll. You may amplify it. And the cursed creature has disadvantage on all concentration saving throws to make t maintain concentration until the end of your next turn. So, that sucks. Not uh, boosted. It is uh, the first hit mm. that connects. But if you amplify it, every single hit... We don't like that. Let's do something fun. Curse of the Exorcist. <laughs> this requires you to be 15th level and have taken the Order of the Ghost Slayer subclass. Oh. As a bonus action, you choose one creature that you can see within 30 feet of you that is charmed or frightened, or which is under a possession effect. The target is no longer charmed, frightened, or possessed. Just as a bonus action, you end that shit. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. Or you can amplify it, and that creature that was charmed, frightened, or possessed uh, uh, takes double possessed. Takes three d six psychic damage and must succeed a wisdom saving throw or be stunned until the end of your next turn. So if you are possessing my friend. Get the fuck out of his body and take that damage and make that saving throw. Or if you're charming, my friend, stop that. Now you make a roll. Shady just says, I just thought of something. Your hands are weapons. Can you brand your hands or slap somebody? Mm. Uh, let me double check. Crimson right. Or brand your weapon. It is considered you have to do it on weapon strikes. So, uh... Unarmed attacks, like especially for monks, are considered unarmed attacks. They are not considered weapon attacks. Hands are melee attacks. Hands are melee attacks, but they're me they're they are melee unarmed attacks. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Trying to break it. Try you tried to break it. I respect that. I respect that a lot. It kind of what's it makes what a monk. A, you know, makes a monk a monk is because they get these unarmed attacks that are just doing 1d10 per hit and they're doing 4 hits per round so it gets pretty intense um yeah well like I mentioned before we're kind of pooped uh we're gonna save our energy for tomorrow don't forget to join us tomorrow hopefully uh, no it, promises. No promises. We're still <laughs> we're still waiting for the level zero human. He's taking his sweet time. So we're gonna end the stream here. Kind of a quick one. Apologize for that, but uh, we're. De I definitely want to get back into Blood Hunter and learn more about their orders, their subclasses, because they got some fun ones. So, thanks, Shady. Appreciate you, buddy. <laughs> uh. I'll still be in the Discord. Don't worry about it. All right, guys. Laters. Bye.